I saw some offering in there, and this, just so you know, this uh, noisy offering will take paper, but it goes for um, uh, world hunger, and we're going to be sending the offering plates around again, so you're going to dig deep today, right? <laughs> we give you thanks for these noisy offerings. So today we heard the story, the resurrection story from Mark. Now, Mark uses two words in his telling of this account, two of the most powerful words in our Bible. Most people never even notice these two incredible words. But even when these two words are pointed out, many don't fully understand the depth of what they mean. You know what two words I'm talking about? Well, let me give you a clue first by backing up a little bit. So this past Thursday here, Monday Thursday, we heard the story of Judas. And we heard how Jesus, fully aware of what Judas was about to do to him, washed Judas's feet. He prayed over Judas. Jesus broke bread, blessed wine, and fed Judas. Jesus didn't have it out for Judas. He didn't shame Judas in front of everybody. He didn't try to hide from Judas. He didn't even give Judas the cold shoulder because of what Judas was going to do. Think about that. Jesus loved and forgave Judas before, before the result of what Judas was going to do had played themselves out. Okay, so the clue here, in case you didn't get it, is before. Before, remember that, it's going to be important later. Jesus included Judas into all the things that transpired that night, acknowledging Judas was one of his closest followers. Jesus loved Judas. Jesus forgave Judas. And Jesus did so before Judas's actions would totally unfold. Okay, let's take another look at Mark's resurrection story and see if you can't hear those two most powerful words. Listen carefully. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go anoint Jesus's body. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll the stone away for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place where they laid him. But go. Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Did you catch it? I know, right? It's just so hard to believe. Really, those two words are that important? Absolutely. The two words are and Peter. The passage says, 
go tell his disciples and Peter. Okay, now that you know the two words, let's set the context of why they're so important here. So just to start, let me ask you, if any one of us had been in Peter's shoes or sandals and had denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times, how many of us would feel anything like a disciple of Jesus's right about now? With the way Peter denied even knowing Jesus three times, Peter, like any one of us, thought he had failed. Peter flunked out of Discipleship 101. And much like the situation with Judas, Jesus did not judge Peter. Jesus wanted to include Peter. So the young man sitting in the tomb in the white, which we translate as being an angel, a messenger of God, the young man named Peter specifically. Go tell his disciples and Peter. Now, unlike the situation with Judas, where Jesus included Judas before Judas did anything harmful, here Jesus is sending the message through the angel to include Peter after Peter did something very hurtful, denying that he even knew Jesus. Now this may seem like a little thing, but back then, or maybe more importantly, right now, for us, this is huge. These two little words tell us that Jesus believed in love and forgiveness. In fact, they prove Jesus meant it. Because while Jesus knew ahead of time that Judas was going to betray him, Jesus acts kindly toward him before Judas had fully betrayed Jesus. I mean, how many times have we been told that we're going to be loved and forgiven, and then we're not? It's an all too common experience for us. It can leave us doubting God's promise of love and forgiveness, of wiping our slates clean. Is it really true? But Jesus inviting back Peter is proof of love and forgiveness even after Peter did his horrible thing. In other words, it's not just a promise of love and forgiveness for each of us no matter what we have done. It's proof of love and forgiveness. Of course Peter was still a disciple. Jesus knew way back when he declared Peter to be the rock on whom Jesus was going to build his church, he knew Peter would struggle. He knew the fears and the challenges that Peter was going to have. Just like he knows ours. And for God's messenger, the angel, to say, go and tell the disciples and Peter meant that Jesus had forgiven Peter. Jesus' dying on the cross was not meant to leave us guessing about whether or not we would be forgiven. The proof was laid out right there in the resurrection story. God had forgiven Peter because God knew who each of the disciples were and who they weren't. God knew what they had done and what they had left undone. God knew the struggles that Judas had, that Peter had, that Thomas, we'll hear about him next week, had. 
Jesus knew about his followers, and Jesus still loved and forgave them. But he didn't just say it. He lived it. He proved it. Even after the disciples had done wrong. This is the first in human history, do you realize? Where a kind and loving God didn't promise love and forgiveness and then not deliver? Where a God did not seek punishment or retribution after something went wrong? This God, our God, proved that love and forgiveness were given no matter what. That's why the words, and Peter, are so important. Let that sink in for a moment. Jesus knew that his disciples would struggle as workers in the kingdom. They would screw up. They would do wrong, just like we have, just like we will. But the good news is that Jesus knows this, forgives us, feeds us, strengthens us, prays for us, because we are loved and forgiven. These are not empty words. Jesus proved it. So come to the table today. This isn't my table. This isn't St. Stephen's table. This is Jesus' table, where he can feed you and nourish you, where you can come and where you are welcome. Thanks be to God. Amen.
please stand as you are able, as together we confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, truth from life, true God from true God, not made. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made a man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken to the Father. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Holy God, we pray for the body of Christ, the church, where the church is persecuted, protect it. Where the church is privileged, grant it humility. Where the church is fractured, heal it. Guide us all to embody Christ's love in this world. God of grace, life-giving God, we pray for the earth, your good creation. Join our prayers with branches lifted up in praise and roaring waters of new life, that together we may proclaim Easter hope. God of grace, merciful God, we pray for all peoples and nations. Free oppressed communities from occupation, exploitation, and abuse. Teach leaders your way of justice. Empower peacemakers and all who work to end violence and strife. God of grace. Liberating God, we pray for people everywhere who long for good news. Roll away the stones that keep people from living with dignity and wholeness. Breathe new life and hope into people struggling to make it through each day. O oh God of grace. Loving God, we pray for this community of faith. And we pray for your Holy Spirit in our midst. Feed us at your Easter table and fill us with your wisdom that we may serve and care for others. God of grace. Yeah. Eternal God, we remember those who have gone before us in death. Renew our trust in your promises that we live with joyful courage and compassion. God of grace. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us turn to one another and share a sign of God's love and peace.